I know many of you have um, have encountered uh, Sherlock Holmes in many in many different forms, whether it's uh, uh, the recurrent TV series or film versions or just uh, the various stories that have become part of the um, popular uh, culture. And even if it's not the sign of four, how many of you have read other stories, novels by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle? Yeah, it's quite a number of you. Um, so I think you all have some familiarity with um, um, you know, the uh, famous uh, detective of Baker Street, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes. And um, you know, one of the intriguing things about Sherlock Holmes is um, uh, you know, the, this detective is an epitome of rationality, um, um, skepticism, um, sharp deductive um, uh, methods. And if I may quote from his, the, the first chapter on the science of deduction, where Holmes says, give me problems, give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram or the most intricate analysis, and I am in my own proper atmosphere. So the, you know, Sherlock Holmes has been famously identified with um, you know, the qualities of um, rationality, um, uh, very rigorous analysis, um, and disciplined methods of um, uh, arriving at uh, solutions to crimes. Um, so this epitome of rationality was actually created by a man, Arthur Conan Doyle, who was himself a spiritualist and deeply interested in occult uh, phenomena. And in fact, um, Arthur Conan Doyle was the uh, president of the Society for Psychical Research, which investigated phenomena like um, uh, spirit apparitions, um, ghost um, uh, photography. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Conan Doyle himself was um, an avid um, taker of photographs of what he claimed were spirits. And um, you know, the whole, there was a very elaborate um, um, science associated with uh, the study of ghosts. Um, and uh, the, the, the theory was that ghosts manifested themselves through ectoplasm. And um, uh, Conan Doyle um, uh, insisted that he was able to capture um, ectoplasm um, on uh, the, the camera film. And uh, one of the, um, you know, one, uh, you know uh, many of the uh, photographs that um, he collected over the years were about photographs and also about fairies. You know, he um, uh, went public saying that he had actually photographed fairies. You know, uh, Yesterday, somebody was asking a question about folk. Was, you, was it you who asked a question about folk tales yesterday, uh, about the idea of the, of the folk tale? You know, some, somebody was um, raising this point. But so, you know, fairies are often associated with um, mythology and with uh, folk tales, right? That they, do, that they don't exist. But Conan Doyle um, um, famously said that he actually happened to take pictures of um, uh, fairies, and he wrote, in, the, in, in fact, a book on fairies, which you can go and read in the library. You know, so, um, uh, about fairies, their physical manifestations, and um, so you know. Uh, I, I, I must also add that uh, many, many years later, you know, the photographs that he had taken of two little girls who were f who were fairies, it would, turned out to be a huge hoax. But this was long after Conan Doyle himself had passed away. Uh, one reason why Conan Doyle got very interested in spiritualism um, was because his um, son had died in the First World War. And there's been a lot of very good scholarship about the confluence of events, um, especially around the First World War, when so many countless people died um, uh, in an unprecedented way in European history. And you know the, the the loss, the sudden loss of so many members of one's family created this distinct yearning among people to um, to reconnect with the souls of their um, lost um, sons or brothers. 
And uh, Conan Doyle was no exception. One of the reasons why he got so interested in occult phenomena was because he could not get over the death of his son. And uh, some of the photographs that he took, um, which are part of the Conan Doyle archive, are of his um, dead son. You know, and he, uh, 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 there was this, uh, the, the exhibitions frequently display these photographs. If they, you ever see, if you happen to be in, in a city where these exhibitions are held, you really should go and see them. There was one in the New York, in, sorry, in the Museum of Modern Art last year on Conan Doyle's um, occult uh, photography. And so it's called rather spirit photography as it was called. And it was really quite an extraordinary display of the many, um, um, photographs uh, of the dead that he had taken. Now, why am I beginning uh, a lecture on uh, Sherlock Holmes, talking about ghosts and fairies and, and spirits? Um, it is because I want to uh, emphasize this um, contradiction between the man who created um, um, Sherlock Holmes uh, as an avid um, um, disciple of the occult um, and yet the, the, the most famous um, uh, character that he had um, um, created is just the very opposite of himself, that is, of Conan Doyle. And um, the skepticism that uh, Sherlock Holmes manifests about everything is really his method of um, unlocking the mysteries of, um, of crimes. And, you know, yesterday when I was talking about, you know, how Wilkie Collins constructs his detective novel, um, you know, which is seemingly about, um, um, you know, the mystery, i.e. the loss of the moonstone, and how the entire novel is constructed around that simple plot line. So by the end of the novel, where it really is less about who committed the theft, uh, rather than um, the more, more, more important questions, um, about what kinds of anxieties and stresses and neuroses uh, come to the surface as a result of um, uh, a criminal um, activity, which is the theft, um, or what is presumed to be the theft of the moonstone, uh, bringing in the detectives. So in this case, in the Sherlock Holmes um, um, stories, at least definitely in the first half of the novel, um, the, um, you know, the plot follows a very familiar um, trajectory. Um, you know, you have that opening scene of uh, Watson and Holmes sharing um, thoughts. And uh, let's not forget that um, Watson has just returned from the Afghan wars, you know, which is, um, um, you know, one of the um, sort of the sticking points of the British in um, you know, a, part, a region of the in, in, um, subcontinent um, that continued to plague um, British control over the rest of the uh, subcontinent. And you can see this theme playing out right from Kim, which we began with, and then into man who would be king. So when, by, when we read Conan Doyle and we find out that Watson has just returned from the Afghan wars, I think you'll get a sh strong sense of how um, uh, you know, the, even though you know so much of the action, uh, definitely in the first half of the novel, is set in the um, uh, in in a kind of staid English home in um, um, in London, Baker Street, and of course, Baker Street is now famous uh, in London um, urban geography. Uh, it's like a tourist spot. You know, people who want to go and see Baker Street just to um, see the street uh, which, uh, in, in the street on which the fictional uh, Sherlock Holmes character lived. So there's this kind of um, um, very incestuous relationship between fiction and reality in the way that um, you know, uh, Baker Street has become synonymous with um, um, its most famous um, resident, even though that resident is fictional. So, um, so, so much of the action occurs in London. And yet, you know, even in that very opening scene um, of Watson um, having just returned from the Afghan wars, there is this reminder that the colonies are not that far off in, um, uh, in, the, in the consciousness of the, um, uh, of the people. 
of, uh, of England. And um, the plot um, gets set off at the moment when Miss Mary Morstan um, um, arrives, you know, with, the, with this puzzle of, uh, again, jewels. You know, we keep coming back to stones, jewelry, gemstones, um, and it seems to run like a, um, like a refrain in so many of these works. And she opens the, this, this, um, this purse of, of uh, loose um, pearls, and, um, and she's trying to understand um, the circumstances of, you know, first of all, why she's getting these pearls on a specific date um, um, every year. And then secondly, she wants to know about the fate of her father, who, not coincidentally, is also um, uh, an, uh, another officer who um, um, had, had been stationed in, uh, in India. So Mary Morstan is that link between the uh, Sherlock Holmes world and, uh, and India. So this is the initial mystery that um, catalyzes the movement of, um, uh, of this novel. You know, what are the, what's the origin of the pearls? And what's the connection between um, the mysterious sender of the pearls and uh, Mary Morstan's, um, uh, what she thought is a missing father, and it turns out of course, that her father is dead. So the, um, uh, and that unfolds the whole story of the Sholtos, Bartholomew and um, uh, Jonathan, is that his name? Well, what's the brother's name? Um, Thaddeus, Thaddeus, right? Thaddeus um, uh, Sholto. So when these two, um, um, when, so if, if this is the precipitating moment of um, uh, the, the, the plot, um, uh, the action begins when they um, they depart for uh, you know, um, what we learn interestingly is called Pondicherry Lodge, and maybe you can take a look at this chapter. Okay, and this is. Um, Chapter five, this one does have numbers. So it's on page 15, if you have your soft copy or if you have the, uh, but it's the beginning of chapter five. It says, it was nearly 11 o'clock when we reached this final stage of our night's adventures. We had left the damp fog of the great city behind us, and the night was fairly fine. It was clear enough to see from some distance, but Thaddeus Sholto took, took down one of the side lamps from the ca uh, carriage to give us a better light upon our way. Pondicherry Lodge stood on its own grounds and was girt round with a very high stone wall topped with uh, broken glass. A single narrow iron clamped door formed the only means of entrance. And um, then, you know, then comes the, um, the, uh, the knock on the door, and, um, um, and then they find out that um, Bartholomew, the brother, um, had been killed. Um, so, uh, this is on page 17. If you can take a look at the middle of page 17, in the paragraph, I stooped to the hole and recoiled in horror. Moonlight was streaming into the room, and it was bright with a vague and shifty radiance, looking straight at me and suspended, as it were, in the air, for all beneath was in shadow. There hung a face, the very face of our companion Thaddeus. There was the same high, shining head, the same circular bristle of red hair, the same bloodless countenance. The features were set, however, in a horrible smile, a fixed and unnatural grin, which in that still and moonlit room was more jarring to the nerves than any scowl or contortion. So like was the face to that of our little friend that I looked round at him to make sure that he was indeed with us. Then I recalled to mind that he had mentioned to us that his brother and he were twins. So the murdered body of um, um, Bartholomew um, um, Sholto is spied through the, uh, through, um, you know, through this hole. And, um, um, and then they break down the door and, um, 
um, as they as they as they find it. Um, okay, um, on the same page in the second column, by the table, you know the paragraph that begins by the table in a wooden armchair, and a few in the next sentence, he was stiff and cold and had clearly been dead many hours. It seemed to me that not only his features, but all of his limbs were twisted and turned in the most fantastic fashion. By his hand upon the table there lay a peculiar instrument, a brown, close-grained stick with a stone head like a hammer, rudely lashed on with coarse twine. Beside it was a torn sheet of notepaper with some words scrawled upon it. Holmes glanced at it and then handed it to me. You see, he said with a uh, significant raising of the eyebrows. In the light of the lantern, I read with a thrill of horror, the sign of the four, the sign of the four. In God's name, what does it all mean? I asked. It means murder, said he, stooping over the dead man. Ah, I expected it, look here. He pointed to what looked like a long, dark thorn stuck in the skin just above the ear. It looks like a thorn, said I. It is a thorn, you may pick it out, but be careful for it is poisoned. Um, and then Watson says, this is all an insoluble mystery to me. It grows darker instead of clearer. And then Holmes surprisingly answers, on the contrary, it clears every instant. I only require a few missing links to have an entirely connected case. So the gap between um, you know, Watson's comprehension of uh, events and Holmes's uh, comprehension is very clear even in these, uh, these sentences, so that the shock and horror and uh, surprise that uh, Watson uh, manifests um, are actually quite absent in Holmes. It's as if he has already been prepared to see exactly this, um, um, this event. And this raises an interesting uh, prospect in, in my mind, which is that there seems to be some intuitive imagination that drives um, um, Sherlock Holmes. Now, we, we have an expectation of rationality and, deduct, and the deductive method as involving um, basing our judgment of things according to what we see. So that, um, like yesterday, you know, we were talking about the facts, ma'am, just the facts. You know, that, you, that the work of de detection is based on um, uh, ascertaining what is in front of you and working exclusively um, from what is available um, in the immediate present, from which uh, um, an event can be reconstructed to suggest um, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, what had happened, and perhaps how um, it had happened. But in this case, Holmes already um, has, you know, he's, it's as if what he's seeing in front of him, the dead man and the poisoned um, thorn, that all of these things, and that, and the, and the uh, uh, most importantly, the, um, um, uh, what is it, the, uh, and also the footprint, that all of this, um, uh, suggest to him, um, as he says, uh, I just, it's, it clears every instant, you know, so that what seem to be like very separate um, parts of the puzzle actually have um, a gestalt meaning. Um, you know what the gestalt is, you know, it's a term used in psychology that you have bits and pieces and, yeah, uh, uh, fragments um, from which you can reconstruct um, a whole. And this is a uh, very important um, concept in um, psychology, gestalt, G-E-S-T-A-L-T. -E and it's a German word um, which signifies reconstruction from um, disconnected um, points. Um, so uh, basically what Fra uh, Holmes is doing is um, saying that all one has to do is connect the dots, you know, that um, the connection of the dots is the first step towards the solving of um, a mystery. So this connecting of the dots um, is not necessarily based on existing empirical visible evidence. It's not just about the facts, but it's about you know, how you can put the facts in relationship to each other. You know, that's the, the most critical factor in uh, deduction, not just 
making an inventory of the facts that this is these are the various items in the um, in the um, uh, you know at a murder uh, or a crime scene, but how you establish a relationship between the seemingly unrelated things. So that here you have the seemingly unrelated um, you know dead body of uh, Bartholomew um, uh, Sholto, um, and then this uh, brown close green stick. Um, and then a torn sheet of note paper, the second item, the torn piece of note paper with sign of four, and the third is the, um, the poisoned um, um, thorn. So um, what for Watson appear as entirely disconnected objects um, take on meaning for um, uh, Holmes? Because as I am suggesting, his, um, um, his method of, of, of deduction involves the um, uh, putting, to, putting into relationship with each other, a whole assortment of unrelated um, facts. And to be able to do that requires a certain amount of imaginative uh, capacity. One cannot connect the dots to determine the relationship between them without imagination without some intuitive ability to think beyond what is immediately uh, in front of you. So um, even this epitome of rationality and skeptical logic, even this person um, appears to be driven by um, you know, something that is supernatural, you know, that this kind of um, uncanny insight that um, Holmes has but Watson uh, is clueless about. And of course, in the literature, it's very common to see Watts, Watson described as a foil to um, Holmes. It, he's like the sidekick, you know, the, um, the, uh, the ignorant and um, uh, sidekick, who is the person who um, professes um, incomprehension about what's going on. And Sherlock Holmes is the you know, solid anchor of authority and, um, and knowledge. But what is, uh, I think, quite striking about Sherlock Holmes is the degree to which he incorporates aspects of this intuitive, supernatural um, insight that um, is really not quite the same thing as, um, um, as rationality. And that association of Sherlock Holmes with um, the um, supernatural um, is particularly vivid, um, you know, in the scene where he's playing uh, the violin. Um, and notice that, uh, I'm trying to see if I can, maybe some of you might remember uh, the page, since now this one has uh, pages. I may not be able to find it uh, here, but I think um, you will remember this, you know, that scene where he, um, you know, he takes, you know, while he is thinking about the murder, what is he doing? He takes up his violin and he starts playing. You know, I mean, this too is very much not like the way that the other detectives, both in this novel and in the previous novel, um, operate, where they're constantly, you know, picking up things like fingerprints and, you know, they, there's a whole forensic science involved in, um, the work of detection. And if Watson is a foil at one level, the other detective, what is his name, Athelby, Athel, Athel something, Jones, um, who is, hmm? Athelney uh, Jones, right? Atherton Jones. You know, that he is like the, um, you know, typical uh, detective, you know, the one who um, uh, is unimaginative, who, um, he's almost bureaucratic in his thinking, who follows standard procedures without ever deviating uh, from them. And so he doesn't think in terms of missing links, but he thinks in terms of what is immediately there and then uh, building a case uh, from that. And it's the, uh, another, uh, another point of difference between Jones and Sherlock Holmes is that Jones has um, you know, great ambitions um, of fame and fortune, you know, that if he solves a mystery, 
uh, he will um, you know, have his name in the papers, he will get a promotion, he will be well known, and um, he will become a minor celebrity um, uh, for having unlocked this, um, this murder. And interestingly, um, Sherlock Holmes is quite willing to allow Jones to take all the credit. And there's a very interesting um, exchange between Jones and Holmes, um, that Holmes does not at all um, stake any claims to the, um, um, you know, to the um, solving of the mystery, and he's perfectly content to let Jones um, uh, take all, all the credit. And it goes back to that line that I just read about how, you know, Holmes is driven by the, the pleasure of, uh, of uh, the uh, detective work. He is less interested in the material rewards that um, are an outcome of detective work. Um, and he's far more um, interested in the um, actual um, physical and intellectual mental labor that is involved in the solving of um, a murder mystery. And here too, I think you might see these developing archetypes. You know, in the first lecture, I spoke about Kim and Colonel Creighton, you know, of, Colonel, of Kim as the embodied um, uh, site of knowledge, you know, the one who actively goes out into the, a dangerous field um, for the thrill of the great game, you know, that there's a certain um, a pleasure that, uh, and a thrill that um, um, uh, Kim has in the act of um, participating in the great game. Uh, whereas, you know, Colonel Creighton is the one who is in the shadows and, um, um, and is receiving input from the field. And, um, and it's usually the manager who, who is known. It's not the, the um, you know, the people who are out in the field. And this is, I think, a dynamic that we see in the very ways that the Secret Service um, um, is uh, built in modern times, you know, that they have to be covert. You know, that's why we call them covert operations, right? That they are out in the field, that they, um, their names cannot be revealed. Um, and yet the knowledge that they extract becomes part of a great archive of um, uh, counterintelligence that um, police services use to um, capture criminals, um, uh, arrest them, put them on trial, and so forth. But Someone is actually doing the dirty work. And in this case, it is um, Sherlock Holmes, you know, who is, um, um, you know, f uh, he's, he's, he's physically mobile, you know, he's the one who is tra traipsing um, across London, you know, going to the Sholto's home, Pondicherry Lodge, who then, in fact, um, pursues Jonathan Small, you know, and the, um, um, the whole uh, reference to the, um, you know, the footprint um, um, that, um, you know, Holmes is able to, um, you know, you know, he puts these uh, advertisements in the newspaper and um, because he surmises that these people might have rented a boat and um, have, uh, uh, might be seeking to depart from, um, uh, from the country. So Sherlock Holmes is, is physically mobile, and um, he's doing all the running around physically, he's doing all the solving mentally, and he's the one who cracks the case. And yet he's perfectly content to let Jones um, uh, take the credit. To, to my mind, this suggests that Sherlock Holmes um, is again a different kind of character. Um, there's something very as ascetic in his uh, personality. He's like. He's almost like a monk in his um, uh, austere um, lifestyle. Uh, he does not seem particularly interested in having relationships with, uh, with anyone. Uh, you know, Watson appears to be um, the only close friend that he has, and even that friendship is like almost a little bullying. You know, Holmes bullies, um, uh, Watson makes fun of him, he plays pranks on him, you know, and he says little games like, um, you know, in the opening section about the, um, what is it about the, hmm? the watch, exactly, you know, that he's talking about the watch and um, it's, it's, it's like, you know, one person is the dummy and the other person is the one who, um, uh, you know, will, will teach the, uh, the stupid person 
to uh, arrive at the solution. So it's even hard to talk about this as a friendship that involves any um, you know, personal um, connectivity. Um, and Watson seems so much more human, more um, um, sort of more full-bodied. Um, and it's also Watson who has, um, who develops an emotional um, uh, uh, connection with Miss Mary Morstan. And, um, and Sherlock Holmes is totally um, sort of indifferent. Uh, Holmes even appears as an, a misogynist um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to some extent. So this austere monk-like appearance of Sherlock Holmes um, also flies in the face of his, um, you know, of, of his self-presentation. Or rather, let me put it this way, the, 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 the uh, popular representation of Holmes as a um, kind of worldly, skeptical, um, secular uh, person. He certainly is very secular in his, um, in his outlook. But the, the kind of austerity that he manifests, and almost this, that, you know, the, the, uh, just to go back to what I was saying about the violin, that when he's playing the violin, he enters into a kind of mystical state. Uh, and uh, Watson even remarks on that. He says, you know, um, as he plays the violin, it's uh, rather overwhelming to see um, Holmes entering into a very different mindset. Um, and the same thing when he's um, on his cocaine, you know, that he, you know, just enters into some other, um, other space, you know, that, um, um, so despite the fact that Holmes is so, um, you know, portrayed as this ultimate ra uh, figure of rationality, the, the, um, um, his tendencies towards mysticism, um, um, and supernaturalism um, are clearly um, evident in this novel. And I would suggest that um, Doyle um, complicates his uh, uh, hero figure by um, uh, incorporating aspects of Doyle's own interests in spiritualism and um, uh, occultism. So the, uh, and, I, and I think it's important for you to pay attention to the dynamic in the novel between um, um, rationality and mysticism as they shape the character of, um, of um, uh, Sherlock Holmes. Um, so let, let's go back to the, um, the um, uh, you know, the, the Pondicherry Lodge. Um, now, John, when, when they enter, first of all, when we first see Thaddeus, let us look at some of those pages. Okay, if you don't mind just taking a look at page 10. It's right at the end of chapter three. Okay, uh, this is the paragraph that begins, we had indeed reached a questionable and forbidding neighborhood. Long lines, and you know, pay attention to the specificity of the description questionable and forbidding neighborhood. Long lines of dull brick houses were only relieved by the coarse glare and tawdry brilliancy of public houses at the corner. Then came rows of two-storied villas, each with a fronting of miniature garden, and then again interminable lines of new staring brick buildings. At last, the ca a cab drew up at the third house in a new terrace. None of the other houses were inhabited. And that at which we stopped was as dark as its neighbors, save for a single glimmer in the kitchen hin uh, window. On our knocking, however, the door was instantly thrown open by a Hindu servant, clad in a yellow turban, white loose-fitting clothes, and a yellow sash. There was something strangely incongruous in this oriental figure framed in the commonplace doorway of a third-rate suburban dwelling house. 
The Sahib awaits you, said he, and even as he spoke, there came a rough, uh, there came a high piping voice from some inner uh, room. Show them in to me, Kit Mutkar, it cried. Show them straight in to me. So the, um, you know, right at the get-go, you know, uh, at the end of chapter three, we have, um, you know, a, a kind of echo of what um, I was talking about yesterday, you know, the spectral image of the, the three priests, you know, appearing in, in the, in, at the windows of the um, uh, Verinda um, household. And here, um, the description of, um, you know, the home of um, the Sholtos um, in this nondescript and even kind of, um, uh, you know, the words that are used like um, a forbidding neighborhood, tawdry, brilliancy, and, um, um, you know, uh, uh, none of the houses were inhabited and all the houses were dark. Um, you know, this kind of menacing, grim, um, you know, fearful aspect to, uh, the na uh, to the neighborhood. And then, you know, the door opens and there's a Hindu standing um, at, the, at the door uh, wearing a yellow turban and, you know, um, and uh, kurta, presumably. Um, so it's, I, I'm just curious to hear from some of you what you, you know, what impression is made um, just with that description alone. Uh, in this particular passage, yes, it, it was fine. We could hear you. Yeah. Uh, so here, uh, one particular word that really fascinates me is the word incongruous. The what? Uh, incongruous. Yes, yes. Uh, exactly. um, it seems like, uh, uh, I mean, the way the passage begins, right? Uh, uh, the, the words that you mentioned, um, uh, questionable, forbidding. There is a sense of incongruity right in the beginning. Just lower your voice. You uh, there, there is a sense of incongruity right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It seems like with the appearance of that Hindu figure, mm -hmm. the incongruity that was there in the atmosphere is somehow extended yeah, yeah. Uh, and somehow confirmed and, uh, Im uh, I mean, uh, uh, while reading, I got this impression that uh, 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 somehow implied was the sense that it was because of the presence of the Hindu figure. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, because of the presence of the Hindu figure, there was this incongruity. Uh, 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 I mean, that's my impression. It seems like the incongruity of the atmosphere is somehow uh, being explained with reference to the presence of the Hindu right, figure. That's a very good point. And um, uh, Kalpana, if you'd like to add something. Uh, somehow, the I felt the readers are led on to expect something sinister that is yes, yes, uh, yes. going to come. Yes, yeah. No, the, 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 both of you have uh, uh, very uh, valid points. Um, here that the, um, that the atmosphere is being built up in a certain way to um, lead one to expect not the familiar, not the um, expected, but something that is sinister, you know, something that is menacing. And, um, and that element of threat and uh, fearfulness um, is first of all um, um, brought out in the actual physical descriptions of the neighborhood. You know, so that the neighborhood um, becomes um, associated with the very body of the incongruous Hindu standing at the, um, at the doorway. And um, uh, Momita, you were saying that the, um, the incongruity is what really stands out uh, for you. Uh, question is why? What is so incongruous about um, you know, seeing somebody with a yellow turban um, 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 loose-fitting clothes, as is described here um, in the book, and the um, answer really would be that you know who, um, that there's this um, um, demarcation of boundaries between East and West that has been uh, shattered by the presence of the Hindu, even though the Hindu is like a butler in the in the um, you know in in the house. Um, but the the movement of uh, you know the kind of the sharp sharply demarcated boundaries between East and West 
um, are already um, uh, shattered. And the presence of an Indian, by the way, we should also clarify, you know, that this in the, in the, in the English, in the uh, British um, terminology, Hindu with a double O, H-I-N-D double O, uh, was often used just as a kind of uh, umbrella term for Indian. It encompassed Muslim, it encompassed uh, Jain, it encompassed Buddhist. So Hindu, as they would put it, with a double O, is, uh, is a term that you see um, repeatedly in the colonial um, um, archives. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who is described as a, as a Hindu is a Hindu. And, um, but the, you know, and, and, and this is part of the um, kind of false construction of Indian identity that we can see is clearly marked in the um, uh, colonial text. Um, so the, this incongruity, the strangeness, um, you know, Freud had uh, this um, way of talking about the um, uh, moments of encounter with the unexpected as the uncanny. You know, he spoke about the uncanny as, um, as, a, uh, as an encounter with, you know, something that seems to be familiar, but is now so altered that it appears as unfamiliar, alien, strange, um, and that the uncanny is, is, an, is, is an aspect that one, is, that is marked in um, a passage like this. Um, and, you know, I would ask you to pay attention in the remaining books that we're going to read in the course, including later today with The Beetle, where urban geography is really um, a major um, part of a work's um, construction. You know, how streets are laid out, how neighborhoods are described, how, um, um, you know, um, people living in an area uh, are almost made interchangeable with the physicality of their um, neighborhoods. And this is particularly true in this passage, you know, so that when Momita says that the, in, it's, uh, it's, 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 um, it's intriguing how the word incongruous, you know, takes one back to the very descriptions of the neighborhood, which are, you know, that no homes are inhabited. You know, it seems bizarre that the, um, is, is this a neighborhood in decline? Is this a neighborhood that has been vacated? Is there, is there some kind of curse, you know, so that people have left a neighborhood, you know? And again, I'm using curse in the way that the Moonstone had come to be regarded as a curse um, by the Verinder family and, you know, wish, willing it away. And um, so there's, there's something very um, uh, puzzling about the uh, physicality of this, of this description. And it's only cemented by this, um, you know, the final description in that paragraph of the, the man in a yellow turban, the Hindu in a yellow turban with the loose fitting um, uh, clothes. So th then we are introduced to Thaddeus um, uh, Sholto, who of the two brothers is the more, um, is the more uh, congenial one. In fact, it is because of Thaddeus that Mary Morstan has even been receiving um, uh, these, um, uh, these pearls. So um, if we can just take a look at, um, uh, uh, on, uh, this is at the, for the uh, chapter four, the first page, uh, the, the story of the bald-headed man. Uh, if you have the, the same um, soft copy, it's on page 11. And um, in the first column, the paragraph that begins, we were all astonished. Um, we were all astonished by the appearance of the apartment into which he invited us. In that sorry house, it looked as out of place as a diamond of the first water in a setting of brass. The richest and glossiest of curtains and tapestries draped the walls, looped back here and there to expose some richly mounted painting or oriental vase. The carpet was of amber and black, so soft and so thick that the foot sank pleasantly into it as into a bed of moss. Two great tiger skins thrown athwart it increased the suggestion of Eastern luxury, as did a huge hookah, which stood upon a mat in the corner. A lamp in the fashion of a silver dove uh, was hung from an almost invisible golden wire in the center of the room. As it burned, it filled the air with a subtle and aromatic um, odor. 
Now, you know, everything of, about this passage reeks of Orientalist excess. You know, the, um, um, the demarcation of East from West is made primarily through this language of um, uh, overabundance, of uh, tawdriness, of um, um, kind of this, this, um, um, you know, this heightened smell of the uh, incense and the carpets and, and this, this, no, this notion of, um, uh, you know, this reference to uh, the tiger skins and Eastern luxury. Um, all this is the, um, is the way that the sholtos are introduced. Um, and again, we're finding something that we talked about last, uh, uh, in the last class, which is the significance of um, material objects and their circulation in, um, uh, in, in Britain, in the colonial era. And, um, uh, you know, the Moonstone has that history of theft and expropriation. But here too, you know, the tiger skins, and um, the tiger skins, uh, of course, are very suggestive of these um, hunts, you know, that uh, were so fashionable among uh, the colonial elite, um, uh, and the uh, kind of machismo that was associated with, um, you know, shooting uh, tigers and um, skinning their um, uh, hides, you know, taking their skins back to England. And I'm sure many of you have seen photographs of, you know, the great um, English explorer, you know, standing on top of uh, a tiger skin as a display of um, his male, um, um, you know, heroism and his, um, um, you know, masculine um, exploits. Now, it, uh, it was often the case that, uh, you know, the person who actually um, did the shooting and the securing of the, um, um, of the pursued animal was, you know, like a servant or, um, or, a, or, an, uh, or a, you know, subordinate. Uh, and in fact, when we read King Solomon's Minds, we find how uh, dangerous um, that situation of, uh, in that case, in that novel, it's the elephant hunt. And um, you know, young African um, you know quasi servants were um, drawn into the elephant hunt, and some of them were killed in the process of securing the ivory um, uh, from uh, you know after obviously killing the elephant. But the ivory too, you know, it's part of that circulation of um, of, um, of um, you know colonial um, wealth. So, you know, just like the moonstone, just like the diamonds that we were uh, discussing yesterday, um, ivory and tiger skins, you know, tiger skins were selling for huge, um, you know, lump sums in, in, uh, in England. So the, um, you know, the shooting of animals for the uh, skins became a very, very lucrative um, um, enterprise. And I think, you know, Kalpana, you raised this very good point yesterday about how, you know, this is, continues to be an aspect of neo-colonial um, activities, you know, that in, um, you know, whether it's in India or in Africa, that um, um, there are these um, very uh, mercenary um, individuals and groups of individuals who um, have virtually decimated the ecologies of, um, of these uh, continents in order to make um, other people wealthy in, in, in the West. So tiger skins, you know, it's, it's one example of that. Uh, the people who returned uh, from the Orient after making huge wealth were considered to kind uh, considered a kind of abomination yeah. in the British society yeah. for their uh, you know high-handed uh, manners and uh, mm -hmm. you know very high-handed well, behavior. This is actually the next thing I wanted to talk okay. about. You know that why you know this description of so, well, probably this description of this uh, replication of Oriental scene there. Uh, superimposed in the English atmosphere yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, has a very negative connotation. Absolutely, this is exactly what I was going to discuss, that the um, portrayal of um, the Eastern world 
as um, reeking of overindulgence and um, um, you know, this kind of luxury, which um, you know, and it came out of this um, this this um, you know long circulated um, 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 stories about you know the rajas you know living in glorious splendor while the poor were dying of uh, of hunger. So the associations of the East, of the, those who came back from the East, they were, there was actually a name um, um, uh, for them. And um, um, they were called Nababs, uh, Nababs, N-A-B-O-B. -B. And it was a corruption of Nabab. But the term Nabob, N-A-B-O-B, -B, was a very derogatory um, label attached to the um, uh, uh, returned um, colonial um, people, um, because they did make uh, huge amounts of money, but they, it was money without culture. You know, that this was the kind of gaudy, tawdry um, display that, um, that, they, uh, you know, that, they, that they had. And so one reason why there's such an emphasis on, you know, the tawdriness uh, the gaudiness of this was to say there may be a lot of wealth in the Sholto family, but that wealth didn't necessarily lead to refinements of sensibility or or culture. And um, the Nabob is a figure that actually exists in, in a number of even some of the better known novels like Vanity Fair. I don't know how many of you have read Vanity Fair by Thackeray, William Makepeace Thackeray. I, mean, it's, I thought it was a very uh, regularly prescribed uh, uh, core, a book in the uh, Indian curriculum, yes? Yeah. But uh, there's one character who's also a nabob like this, and that's Joseph Sedley. And he's always, mar he returns to India, um, sorry, he returns from India to England, having amassed a huge fortune in, uh, uh, in India. But everyone mocks him because he's, he's obese, he's kind of clumsy, he's very, he's a slob. And these are all descriptions of him, you know. So it, this is, uh, and 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 the and the whole description of the Sholto house is so minute. Um, I, I believe in order to emphasize um, the nabob, um, you know, culture that these people um, uh, represent. So you have, on the other hand, you know, Schult, um, Sherlock Holmes, and then you have uh, uh, Watson, who are. Um, you know, who surround themselves with books, with music, with refinements of culture, and uh, the Sholtos having returned from India. And not the Sholtos themselves, but the, the, their house is built on money that was um, um, acquired in, illicitly in, uh, uh, in India. So that's the, so, you know, and, you know, and once we, um, Meet um, uh, uh, Thaddeus Sholto. The uh, the plot then, you know, we get a, you know, we we we're given the backstory of why the pearls were given um, to uh, Miss Morstan uh, one by one to on um, every year. Um, the I, I wanted to dwell a little bit on why Pondicherry Lodge. Why is why do you think there might be some significance in in um, naming the house of the Sholtos, Pondicherry Lodge. The complication between the British and the French at that point of time, mm. and uh, again, that has a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. What's the negative connotation? Um, probably the, it is aligned more towards the French, or uh, does, does it mean something like that? Mm? Uh, they are aligned more towards the French, or uh, did they make the money from the French colony? Who? Uh, the Sholtos? There does not seem to be indication that they made money of the French colony, but is there some, is there, I mean, can we think allegorically about this? You know, can, um, is do, you know, like in um, uh, Kim, you know, when Hari Babu travels secretly to Chandarnagar, we get a hint that you know Hari Babu is playing a double game. You know, on the one hand, he pretends that he's working for the British as a spy for the British, but then by traveling to Chandernagar, uh, another French colony, there's this hint that he is working outside the purview 
of um, the British um, Empire. Um, there might be exactly that kind of association in this novel, that um, even if the Sholtos uh, may not have specifically had anything to do with, um, with, uh, with the French, the naming of Pondicherry Lodge shows that they are not thinking in terms of the British Empire, but they're thinking of the competitor or the rival of the British Empire. So in other words, that these individuals, you know, Captain Morstan, Major Sholto, you know, the, 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 fa the fathers of the principal characters in this novel, they acted very independently of um, uh, what they were paid to do in, uh, in India, which is to govern, to administer, to enforce, you know, as, poli as uh, soldiers in the um, military regiment. Um, um, but they were, these, these guys were making money. And it's, it's like, what's the difference between Major Sholto and um, uh, um, uh, Captain Morstan? And on the one hand, and David, uh, Daniel Dravet and um, Carnahan in The Man Who Would Be King. You know, they're all out to serve their own interests. You know, so it's like there's a parallel state that's going on. And I think this is why the term Pondicherry Lodge become so significant, you know, that they are, it's, a, it's as if they are creating another um, state of their own, not an empire necessarily, but another state um, um, of their own. And, um, you know, by, by the name Pondicherry, um, uh, we, we um, you know, we're sort of given some insight into um, you know, very ugly um, um, history, which we've already seen, you know, in the Moonstone. You know, the same, it's, it's almost as if it's the same story that's getting repeated again and again in these novels of, uh, of empire, of, um, um, you know, officers, colonial officers who are sent to the colonies, either as administrators or working in the military regiments or, or even as, you know, in the bureaucratic um, offices as clerks as Elihu Yale originally was. Um, hmm? uh, David Koff has mentioned uh, uh, there is a specific word called the writers. These writers was basically the clerks or the babu. But they were uh, at that time, in that colonial time, I'm talking about the Bengal. Uh, that term was writers. The babu. Uh -huh. yeah. These writers are the clerks. Yes, that's, yeah. that's right. Who used to write right. the, the colonial document. Yeah, that's right. So they were actually called the writers, but they yeah. were, it was like, they were like accountants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They Hello. were called writers, but they were accountants, yeah. you know, and that's, they were hired. Elihu Yale was one such person. He was hired as a, yeah. as a writer, but basically he was doing accounts in, um, um, uh, in the colonies. So you have all these people who are sent out officially to the colonies, but like Dravet and Carnahan in the Kipling story, they also branch out into very independent, um, you know, corrupt uh, regimes, you know, that they um, amass their own uh, wealth. And in this case, we find out. Um, I read it very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere, you know, I got an impression that uh, they're Jewish, of Jewish origin. I may be wrong. Jewish origin? Yeah. I, I'm not sure that that's the case. Okay, ma'am. Because I happen to read it very fast, like how we read for the exams. So, so I might have missed. Uh, yeah, I think that's there. that's uh, that's probably not uh, it's probably not uh, the case. But anyway, just to just to continue this, um, I'm I'm spending a bit of time just talking about um, the layout of this uh, of this house because it establishes what I am referring to over the course of these lectures as certain archetypal patterns in the um, construction of novels of, uh, of empire. And we keep coming back to you know, these archetypes of, of um, uh, empire, um, you know, empire building, empire um, administration, um, while at the same time there are individuals who, like John Herncastle, like Dravet, like Peachy Conahan, and here like Sholto and, um, and uh, um, um, Morstan, who have ended up, um, um, you know, really exploiting, um, um, you know, their availability, uh, the easy availability of money and, um, 
and treasure um, for their own uh, benefit. So this is what we know in the first half. You know, we don't really know too much about the circumstances and, and um, to go back to what I was saying about the missing um, um, links, um, you know, it, the, the first half of the novel is really about uh, Holmes' efforts to, um, you know, to, um, to find the relationship between these various um, pieces of evidence. The paper with the sign of four, the, the, the poisoned thorn, and the footprint, and the, um, um, you know, there was something else which I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, just uh, missing. But let me, I, I, it's because of the footprint that I am um, pausing here. Uh, and this perhaps is the most revealing um, of all. Let's, um, so just give me a moment. Okay, this is on, um, which chapter is this? Let me just find this chapter. Okay, this is chapter eight. I'm sorry that it took me a little while to, to get to this. Chapter eight, the Baker Street Irregulars. Now, um, just one quick note about the Baker Street Irregulars. It's, um, it's curious that, you know, I mentioned that uh, Holmes is, uh, oh, by the way, can I have the fan on, you know, fan? I need the fan. I was wondering why it's so hot here. You know, the, uh, I mentioned earlier that the um, that Sherlock Holmes is physically mobile, right? He pursues the the um, uh, the, the murders. He uh, you know he uh, puts a notice in the newspaper, takes a boat, and then he chases him down. Okay, but he also uh, is like a Colonel Creighton figure in another respect, in that he hires his little band of people to do the dirty work for him. And they're called the Baker Street Irregulars. And um, it's a curious name. It almost sounds like a, um, you know, like a pop band, you know, the Baker Street Irregulars. But the Baker Street Irregulars are described as urchins, street urchins, and they're described as Arabs, you know, like immigrants. And that, you know, Sherlock Holmes, and he, he um, uses the um, um, uh, service of of immigrants and um, gypsies and Arabs. There are the references to Arab boys who are part of the Baker Street Irregulars. So um, there is an indication in this novel that there's some areas of the town that, um, that defy um, uh, Holmes's uh, knowledge. You know, that um, he doesn't know the totality of London. And on the, but these Baker Street irregulars do, you know, that they are able to penetrate into different slums, into different ethnic neighborhoods, that they are able to get into places that um, Sherlock Holmes is not able to get into himself. So even though he's very physically mobile, he still at some point must depend on the service of others. Just like Colonel Creighton who has to depend on uh, local uh, native boys like um, uh, like Kim, so it was a point that I thought you would need uh, that uh, that is worth um, uh, that is worth mentioning. So um, in this chapter, oh sorry, I think it was the.
Yeah, it is. Sorry, it is the Baker Street regulars. This paragraph that begins, he stretched his hand up. I'm trying to get that page number. Ah, uh, okay. Um, huh? Page number? Which one? Page 30. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is one. He stretched his hand up. Thank you. It is on the bottom of... Um, okay, when he discovers the, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, that he surmises that there's a wooden-legged man who um, had murdered um, Bartholomew, and that there's also another footprint that, um, um, if the first column of page 30, he says, I have no, um, and he says, um, what is it? He says, this should really be an easy mystery to solve, because if every man had an easy task, this of ours ought to be. Wooden-legged men are not so common, but the other man, I should think, be absolutely unique. You know, so this is, this is the challenge really lies in who is this other person who has helped in the murder? Or of Bartholomew Sholto, if not the actual murderer himself. And then Holmes says, I have no wish to make a mystery of him, to you anyway, but you must have formed your own opinion. Now do consider the data. Diminutive foot, foot marks, toes never fettered by boots, naked feet, stone-headed wooden mace, great agility, small poison darts. What do you make of all of this? You know, so again, it's this What's the relationship between these, um, these multiple, um, um, you know, evidence? You know, the naked feet, you know, shoe toes that don't seem to have ever been um, constricted by boots, and then darts, poison darts. And of course, he, uh, he, Holmes says everything that uh, is required for Watson to exclaim, a savage, perhaps one of those Indians who were the associates of Jonathan Small. And hardly that, said he, when first I saw signs of strange weapons, I was inclined to think so. But the remarkable character of the footmarks caused me to reconsider my views. Some of the inhabitants of the Indian Peninsula are small men, but none could have left such marks as that. The Hindu proper has long and thin feet. Now, in this sense, he really does mean Hindu, because in the next sentence he says, the sandal-wearing Mohammedan has the great toe well, well separated from the others <coughs> because the th uh, th uh, thong is commonly passed between. These little darts could only be shot in one way. They are from a blowpipe. Now then, where are we to find our savage? South America, I hazard, had hazarded. He stretched his hand up and took down a bulky volume from the shelf. This is the first volume of a gazetteer which is now being published. It may be looked upon as the very latest authority. What have we here? Andaman Island, situated 340 miles to the north of Sumatra, in the Bay of Bengal. Hum hum, what's all this? Moist climate, coral reef, sharks, Port Blair, convict barracks, Rutland Island, cottonwoods. And then he goes on to describe the aborigines of the Andaman Islands, who may perhaps claim the distinction of being the smallest race upon the earth, though some anthropologists prefer the Bushmen of Africa, the Digger Indians of America, and the Terra del Fueyans. So um, this, uh, uh, this kind of this pivotal passage in this, um, in this novel um, gets right at the heart of a major enterprise of, um, of British colonialism, which is to produce um, an ethnographic inventory of different characteristics of uh, the Indian races. In fact, this was a this was a major compilation of the ethnologists um, um, of British India. You know, where they compiled 
um, um, you know, um, evidence of, not evidence, but a kind of a description of um, the different races of India, you know, from um, South India to, um, you know, uh, uh, the Western uh, states in India and all the way towards what are the Northeast um, states. So this inventory of, of traits, of facial features, of height, of skin color, um, that all of this was part of a um, very elaborate um, archive of knowledge that constituted the basis of um, um, you know, the British knowledge of India. And I find it so telling that um, you know, Sherlock Holmes um, has partly deduced um, that this uh, could not just be un-Indian from the mainland, because he says this, this person seems to be too small to have been from, um, from, uh, from the you know, mainland, from the peninsula. And then his derivation of um, the identity of the second, the accomplice of Jonathan Small as an aborigine of the Ab uh, Andaman Islands. Um, uh, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's as far as his own knowledge can go, you know, based on the footmark. But the, the rest of the knowledge is what I have been describing as institutional knowledge. In, uh, in these lectures. And this is a very clear example of how Sherlock Holmes turns to the um, institutional knowledge uh, that is um, uh, contained in the gazettes, you know, the British um, uh, produced gazettes, which have inventoried all the racial um, characteristics of peoples of the Indian uh, subcontinent, including the islands. So we discover then that the um, um, that, uh, that the, the savage, as Watson um, puts it, was in fact um, um, an, in uh, an inhabitant of the Andaman Islands. And this is the first time that we are getting some insight into um, a much deeper history that is re revealed only in the second half of the um, novel. So the first half of the novel should actually be technically the end of the novel. Because the mystery is solved, the murderers are detected, and um, um, the aborigine is killed. You know, he doesn't even have a name. He's just described as an aborigine. Um, and the aborigine is killed. And, um, and, but um, the one thing that has not yet been adequately um, understood is why the sign of four. You know, the three, the four crosses with the um, horizontal line across them that that's the one mystery that still prevails at the end of the first half of the um, novel. The murder has been, uh, mystery has been solved, and the murderer has been killed. Um, but there are two uncertain outcomes. One outcome is that the um, treasure that um, um, you know, the murderers have taken from Bartholomew Sholto's house, that that treasure sinks to the bottom of the Thames River and presumably uh, is gone forever, right? And the second, um, which I just mentioned, is that the sign of four, uh, the significance of, of that uh, term is not adequately um, revealed. Um, but to all intents and purposes, the novel should end at the end of the first uh, half. You know, um, the, the criminal is arrested, the uh, crime uh, has been solved, and Athel need, uh, Jones um, uh, is very smug and thinks, oh, you know, the Metropolitan British Police have yet another success to, um, to celebrate and um, um, to publicize. So, you know, end of story. But that's not the case. There's a second story that begins um, with the arrest of Jonathan Small. And it's that second story which is the truly uh, interesting and the, uh, the core, the heart of the novel. So much so that the first half seems almost like a distraction, that it's only, it's setting the scene for what, we, what is revealed in the, um, in the second half. Uh, and in the second half, we get the whole story of, of who Jonathan Small is, how he ended up in India, how he ended up in the Andaman Islands, and how he um, um, virtually adopted um, um, uh, Tonga, then we find out 
the Aborigines name, Aborigine, I put it in quote marks, has a name called Tonga. And Tonga and uh, Jonathan Small become, um, become this team. Now, it's in the second half that the circumstances of um, 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 s a small story become clear. And I'm not going to recap the, the plot outlines because I'm assuming you would have read it. But we, we, we are told that Jonathan Small um, is one of those sort of um, lower rung colonial um, um, you know, subordinates who is sent out, into, uh, sent out to India that Jonathan Small himself comes from a very um, kind of low English, um, lower middle class in, uh, English society. And he's a bit of an outsider himself in England because of his class position. And that in India, he is, um, um, you know, he has, uh, he's sent off to the Andaman Islands because he has killed someone, right? And the Andaman Islands, and I know you, all of you would know this, of course, what's the significance of the Andaman Islands in the British history? Hmm? Exactly, it was a penal settlement, and not just a penal settlement, it was also a penal um, uh, um, center for um, the most um, uh, radical and dangerous political subversives. They were all um, rounded up, um, and not just kept in jails in the Indian Peninsula, but sent off to the Andaman Islands because the islands were presumed to be remote enough that they couldn't easily escape or establish any links with, um, you know, kind of under, um, you, know, um, you know, underground um, links with uh, any other rebel. So the, the, this penal settlement, um, you know, convicts colony, um, was also where the most dangerous political um, uh, subversives um, uh, were sent off. So that's where Jonathan Small finds himself. And because of the, his, um, um, you know, his skills with um, um, uh, you know, dealing with the Andaman Islanders, he's made into like an overlord or an overseer, I shouldn't say over, overseer, of, um, um, of, uh, of the um, uh, Andaman Islanders. Now his relationship with Tonga is perhaps one of the most vivid relationships in this novel, in a novel which really seems not to have any, um, you know, any bonds of any sort. You know, even the romance, the budding romance between Watson and Miss Mary um, is complicated by the fact that Watson believes that if she is the heir to Morstan's wealth, it will put her in a higher class position than he would, um, um, you know, that he has available to himself. So he would not be able to be an adequate suitor for Mrs. For, for, uh, for Miss Mary. So even that romance between Mary and uh, Watson is possible only at the end of the novel when the treasure has sunk to the ocean, bottom of the ocean. And notice here, it's like a similarity when I talk about archetypal themes. Um, in the last novel, The Moonstone, the marriage between Franklin and Rachel is possible only when the moonstone is out of the picture. You know, the moonstone hangs like an albatross over their romance. And the same thing is true with, in this novel, the, this uh, illicit treasure that is not coming out of, you know, um, you know um, honestly earned work, or, um, but it's coming out of illicit fortunes gained in India through murder and deception, that that wealth that is now infiltrating um, um, England um, um, uh, it will not even allow uh, romantic relationships to, um, to flourish. And um, Jonathan Small is, um, um, you know, the, the bond that he has with Tonga is also because, you know, he had rescued Tonga, you know, saved him uh, when Tonga was almost about to die. And then Tonga returned the favor with an undying devotion. To, um, um, to Jonathan Small. So if there's any unconditional love in this novel at all, it really is between um, uh, Tonga and uh, uh, you know, the feelings that Tonga has for Jonathan Small. Not necessarily that Jonathan Small has the same feelings for Tonga. In fact, Jonathan Small has no compunctions in putting um, uh, Tonga on display in England as a freak. You know, he wants to, needs to earn money. 
when he's back in England, because he comes back to England to take revenge for having been um, um, deprived of, uh, of his riches. And, but in order to have money in, uh, to survive on a day-to-day -day basis in, in England, what does he do? He you know, puts um, uh, Tonga in a freak show. And that too is one of the spectacles of Victorian England, you know, where you had the hot and taut Venus, and you had um, you know, kind of what were called the wild tribes of Africa, and here the savage from the Andaman Islands. So that they're put on display in circus freak shows. And um, Jonathan Small makes his money off of him. But the, the circumstances of Small's um, revenge are really the, 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 that's the real heart of the story. It's not even the murder of Bartholomew Sholto. The heart of the story is the point at which, um, um, you know, the, the, that whole, um, you know, with this Raja, the Agra, the Agra treasure, um, maybe we can just take a quick, I know it's well past time. <coughs> This is chapter 11, the great Agra um, treasure. Well, it's really, you know, it's the strange story of Jonathan Small. Um, Okay, I mean, I'm not going to read all of this out, but if you look at page 44, um, there were this, this, is, this is that band. This is, this is the first clue that we have about who the sign of four are. Um, he says he, you know, this was Jonathan Small's work. He had to keep watch. And then he says there were, I, had, I kept watch with my Punjabis. They were tall, fierce looking chaps. Mahomet Singh and Abdullah Khan by name both old fighting men who had borne arms against us at Chilianwala. They could talk English pretty well, but I could get little out of them. And so um, then they preferred to stand together and jabber all night in their queer Sikh lingo. And so um, later on, um, you know, they, they hear you know, all uh, this noise and he says, my first thought was that these fellows were in league with the rebels and that this was the beginning of an assault. If the door were in the hands of the sepoys, the place must fall, and the women and children be treated as they were in Kanpur. And what's that reference to? The women and children be treated as they were in Kanpur. The mutiny. You know, so that's the kind of the, the, um, the, um, the, the context in which, you know, there are rebellions that, you know, it's, something is afoot in India at the time. And you know, people are fleeing, you know, the Rajas are fleeing you know, um, from one you know, province to the other um, to ensure the, um, that, their, that their wealth will not be uh, lost in all this turmoil that is occurring. So this thing about that the, they will all be treated as they were in Kanpur. Maybe so the fear of the mutiny is the one that's driving everyone there, you know, the British as well as the, um, the, uh, you know, the Rajas. Maybe you gentlemen think that I'm just making out a case for myself, but I give you my word that when I thought of that, though I felt the point of the knife at my throat, I opened my mouth with the intention of giving a scream. And then that's the point at which, uh, and, and uh, this is Abdullah Khan who says, listen to me, Sahib, you must either be with us now or you must be silenced forever. The thing is too great for one of us to um, hesitate. And then they create this, um, uh, they create this contract amongst each other that they will, you know, this, the, the, um, you know, they kill off this Raja and they secure the treasure. Um, but the treasure can only be safely protected if that the whole group, you know, this band of four um, swears allegiance to each other. And the sign of four becomes a very cryptic, uh, it's a cryptogram. Remember when uh, Sherlock Holmes says, the cryptogram is what engages my mind because I like solving puzzles? The sign of four is a cryptogram, it's a puzzle. And the puzzle refers to the fact that the, um, um, the sign of the, f of the four um, uh, crosses tied, you know, connected together 
um, represent um, a band of brothers who um, you know, constitute their own micro-nation. This is a nation without any, um, without a king, without a, a, a head, without a ruler, but it's like this uh, egalitarian um, um, micro world that they have created for themselves, the sign of four. And um, the irony, of course, is that three of them are um, Indian. One, there's one Sikh, right? And, um, and what is it, Mohammed um, Khan and, what is it, Mohammed, um, hmm? Yeah, so you have a dost, yeah, dost, um, Abdullah Khan. Yes, that's right, and um, Mahmoud Singh. So you have, you know, four, you know, you have, yeah, you have three who are Indian, and then you have the fourth who is a white Englishman. And this thing, this, this sign of four as, you know, you can even say three plus one. That three, there's, there, there's, there, there are three, um, who you know are share certain ethnic um, features, and then there's the anomaly, you know, the incongruity again. You know, the incongruous Jonathan Small becomes part of the band of uh, uh, of four, the sign of four. And um, just to, I mean, this is just a theory that I've been thinking about. Um, you know, Jung, you know, the um, um, uh, Carl Jung, who in fact is the person who. Um, made his entire work on archetypes of the collective unconscious. You know, I know many of you might have read um, uh, Freud, but Jung was, um, you know, perhaps one of the most significant um, 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 uh, psychoanalysts in uh, modern uh, psychology. And um, his, his most famous um, concept was the archetypes of the collective unconscious, that there are certain recurring archetypes that um, are the substratum of many different cultures. Uh, they, they are very different, they're very um, diverse, but there's this kind of running thread in, in many um, uh, cultures. And Jung talked about this, Jung, J-U-N-G, he talked about this as the collective unconscious. Now, Jung also had his theory, you know, Jung wrote a lot about mandalas, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, because he had thought about the mandala. He, in fact, the mandala was his operating concept of the uh, cosmic consciousness. He saw the mandala, the Tibetan uh, mandala, as a map of um, the human mind. That was the way that um, um, uh, Jung uh, thought about uh, the mandala. You know, it's a map of the human mind. But he also developed his, this theory of um, that the world is such that there's a combination of three plus one. And this three plus one, what he meant by that was that there, uh, you know, that units are not necessarily all the same, that the components are not all the same. You may have three that are more alike, but then you have one in that unit that is somewhat different. And Jung talked about the three plus one as one of the um, um, kind of um, um, you know, ways in which you know human societies have always developed um, diversity. That there is some element of a, a difference and diversity within the homogenous whole that makes for um, the um, you know this, this this the possibility of the collective possible. Um, so I have been thinking about that and I have been wondering whether the sign of four of, of the three plus one, you know, the three Indians plus the white Englishman, is part of this very elaborate way of thinking about a different kind of community which is not British, you know, the kind of centered uh, empire and not the, um, you know, the native uh, Rajas and so forth. But it's, it is symptomatic of the very drive that pushes uh, Daniel Dravet and Carnahan and the Kipling story to become these parallel rulers, you know, in Kafiristan. And here, the sign of four becomes a contract of um, allegiance. And this is very, very important for um, um, Jonathan Small. His allegiance is no longer to the British. He says, my, I will not let my brothers um, um, be, um, um, you know, disfavored 
Yeah. So whatever each one of us has will be shared with the, uh, the rest of us. The sharing. It's a, it's a kind of micro um, world of egalitarianism and um, um, you know um, equality. So the, um, the the allegiances are shifting. Um, and Jonathan Small is, is, a, is a curious element. Uh, he doesn't really fit into England at all. And um, in the sign of four, you have the emergence of um, a theme that I think is links Conan Doyle to some of these other writers, um, like um, um, uh, Kipling. And, and I think the reason for that is exactly that, that sense of, um, um, you know, how um, you know, Jonathan Small keeps saying injustice has been committed. Um, and um, my, my brothers, he keeps referring to, um, um, you know, the, his collective as my brothers. He says, my brothers have been um, unjustly treated. And um, so it's the allegiance that he has to, um, to all of them. Um, but I want to end because I, I've really gone well past um, uh, time and I, I will still leave uh, maybe 10 minutes for some, for some questions uh, and discussion. Um, but I wanted to end by saying that um, the, 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 uh, the structure of this novel is so anomalous that it should have ended at the end of the first, um, you know, first half when the uh, uh, treasure sinks to the bottom of the sea, uh, river, and uh, Jonathan Small is arrested. But Sherlock Holmes says, you tell your story now. You tell your story. So Jonathan Small's story becomes the, um, the stand-in for the subaltern voice in, um, uh, in this narrative. And uh, this, I think this is one of the novellas of, uh, of Conan Doyle, which is the most explicitly located in, uh, in India. And I, far more complicated than uh, its length uh, might suggest. So let me stop here and maybe we can, you can have your tea and um, we, can, we can discuss. I'm sorry, I had some, maybe if you can just. Uh, uh, Ma'am. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, like, uh, throughout all these novels, uh, the Indians or uh, the natives of the uh, other East uh, are portrayed like very exotically or very mysterious, very spiritual kind of way. Uh, but uh, according to mine, uh, but uh, at the same time, like in India, uh, there was this uh, parallel way of construction hap was happening of this scientific man, this man, uh, man uh, which actually was imitating this West. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this Do you mean like Hari Babu? Yeah, Hari Babu. And uh, like I could actually uh, draw this parallel to the Sherlock Holmes, be, uh, to this Bengali detective Byomkesh Bakshi. Uh -huh. So uh, this, uh, so uh, can you just give some insight like where that was happening in Indian context where this imitation of the colonizer was happening, how to become like a colonizer mm -hmm. and how to become the scientific rational man than, this ex uh, than the exotic spiritual human? Yeah, I think one reason why Sherlock Holmes has been so popular in India and there have been uh, many um, uh, um, uh, like um, spin-offs from um, the uh, con in fact, there's one by Vasudev. I'm trying to remember his full name. Who had maybe? Hmm? Yeah, that's right. And he had. Um, he has another. You know, he has one of the shows. There's so many. I have to say, my favorite take off um, spin-off in um, the Sherlock is it is by a Tibetan writer um, by the name of uh, Namyang Yam Jamyang Norbu N O R. Bu, and he's written a novel called *The Mandala* of Sherlock Holmes. Coming back to *Mandala*, and uh, if I can, you know, if it's it's available. It's in print in India. It's not, unfortunately, it's not in print um, elsewhere now. But it's a fascinating novel, um, which actually combines Kim, Kipling's Kim, and um, *The Sign of Four. 
It combines um, not, not just Sinophore, actually it's more than that. And the reason for that, the reason why a Tibetan writer can step in to write this novel, um, which is so faithful to the character of Sherlock Holmes, is that the, um, you, some of you might remember, um, it's in the empty house, is it in the empty house? When Conan Doyle got very sick and tired of writing all the Sherlock Holmes novels and stories, and he decided to kill him off. And uh, he had, you know, his mortal enemy, Moriarty, who's a mathematician, by the way, remember? Uh, Moriarty was a mathematician, uh, like an evil genius. And uh, Moriarty um, killed off uh, Sherlock Holmes, pushing him off the uh, waterfalls, in the Reichenbach uh, waterfalls. And, um, and uh, uh, Conan Doyle was very happy because he just didn't, he was too tired of writing um, these, uh, these stories. But the public got so upset, you know, there was a huge fandom, you know, for, uh, there was a, in fact, in the Victorian, um, in the, um, in, in Doyle's time, there was this huge fan club. Um, they were called the Baker Street fans or something like that. And they, com they went on uh, protest marches, demanding that Sherlock Holmes be brought back to life. So two years later, um, uh, Conan Doyle very reluctantly um, um, wrote um, um, a story, and I think this is the haunted house. Um, my memory sort of fails me, but he, um, you know, he re then he resumed writing about Sherlock Holmes. But he had to account for the fact that Sherlock, there were two missing years, because those are the two years when he wrote nothing. Uh, he had killed him off, and so he had to account for the fact that. Uh, Sherlock Holmes had died in the Reichenbach Falls and then suddenly comes back to life two years later. So what um, Conan Doyle writes is that for two years, Conan Doyle was wandering the Indian subcontinent and uh, uh, wandered into Tibet. This is what he writes, just two sentences, that's all. That he wandered in the Indian subcontinent and uh, walked, uh, wandered into Tibet. And this Tibetan writer, Norbu, takes those two lines and he reconstructs an entire story about those missing years of, um, um, you know, so that uh, when um, Holmes went to um, Tibet, he um, joins the cause of the Tibetans against the Chinese occupation. So it's so fascinating. You must read this novel because what Norbu does is that he creates parallels between the British colonization of India and the Chinese occupation of Tibet. And in this novel, Sherlock Holmes becomes the liberator of Tibet from the Chinese. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's highly imaginative and, um, uh, but still very faithful to the original stories. Um, uh, Norbu creates this, um, this work that allows for thinking of a life of Sherlock Holmes well beyond British colonialism and extending to an understanding of contemporary uh, Tibet-China um, uh, relations. But there's one more interesting aspect of this life which I think builds on what is already there in the Sherlock Holmes story, which is that in the, it's still not enough to say that Sherlock Holmes is, um, um, you know, uh, is a kind of a, a liberator of Tibet. One has to explain how he came back to life after having died in the Reichenbach Falls. And then it is told in, in this novel that Sherlock Holmes is actually the reincarnation of a Buddhist monk who um, uh, has been, um, you know, who returns to the Buddhist monastery in uh, Tibet. So, and when I say what's picked up in this novel, and I mentioned that he's very austere, he's very, you know, he's not particularly interested in worldly things, apart from, you know, cocaine is the only thing that he seems to be interested in as a substance, but he's not interested in anything else, that and playing the violin. So this kind of austere, monk-like life of, the, of uh, Sherlock Holmes is what the Tibetan writer picks up on and elaborates that to talk about um, uh, Sherlock Holmes as a, um, as a monk. So I, I'm, I know that's not answering your question, but I, I needed to put that in somewhere. 
Um, but I also did want to, you know, respond to you by saying that it is true. It is true that the um, the figure of the uh, scientist, you know, the rational scientist, um, was one that, um, um, you know, was quite important to the self-representation of Indians at the time. That they were not wrapped up in superstition and ritualism and uh, occult mysticism and uh, and what have you. And um, that they were as capable, the Indians were as capable of a scientific bent of mind as, um, as, as the British. So Sherlock Holmes' adaptation to the Indian context actually came out of that imperative of using him as a model for enabling a certain, uh, you know, the production of the Indian um, secular and rational um, uh, subject who was equally capable of um, you know producing these great um, um, insights, and if I can also add one um, other comment, I know many of you, of course, would have heard of Srinivas Ramanujan, you know, the great uh, mathematician. But you know, Ramanujan um, often uh, claimed that the uh, great mathematical insights that he had came as a result of occult tendencies. You know, that the Namagiri, you know, he would say the goddess Namagiri gave him the gifts of mathematical um, 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 uh, ability. And that um, uh, he you know, could, would see, you know, he would say, I would see the god Narsama with numbers, you know, scrawled, um, you know, um, uh, um, scrawled on his big uh, tongue. And those were the numbers that I saw and, um, you know, fed my mathematical imagination. So when Ramanujan said that sort of, um, you know, talked about, his mathematics in terms of occultism. Other Indian students of mathematics and science were very displeased with Ramanujan for this reason that, that you are trying to get at. Because it seemed, Ramanujan seemed to reaffirm the old stereotypes of the, the occult Easterner, whose, um, 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 you know, whose imagination is shaped by, um, and, and you know, scientific gifts are shaped by occult um, uh, tendencies. But I, this is one reason why I wanted to emphasize Sherlock Holmes's own occult tendencies. Because it was not a clear cut question that he was purely rational. So that when Indian uh, writers sort of adapt Sherlock Holmes to their own purposes, you know, highlighting Sherlock Holmes's rational deductive aspect, they were also doing so in order to construct a certain model that they believed was essential to counter the existing stereotypes. But that is not a comprehensive reading of Sherlock Holmes, you know, by the Indian adapters, because they were really sort of exclusively reading. Uh, especially I'm thinking about the connection between uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, in Indian context, that Byumkesh, Detective Byumkesh Bakshi and that Sherlock Holmes. There is almost, uh, a 50 years gap because Bhumkesh Bakshi, that Indian detective, was uh, all these episodes by Dudashan and the latest film by Dibakar Banerjee. It's showing all these uh, that this uh, Indian detective was uh, active around uh, Second World War, or yes. around Second World War. Mm -hmm. But the, again, uh, uh, their way of looking at the outer world or, 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 to, or to searching for the truth or the facts is very curious that how. They, and, and here in that Indian setting also that Detective Boomkes Bakshi is coming from uh, educated, mm -hmm. uh, from a highly empirical training, from mm -hmm. institutional training. Mm -hmm. So both that institutional training or that way of looking at the outer world is very connected in that, oh, okay. in the both contexts. But you have talked about today, you have elaborated somewhere that the last point to how to search for the truth, mm -hmm. especially in the moonless stone. Mm -hmm. And you have somewhere extended that point by saying that the method of deduction, mm -hmm. uh, how to connect dots, mm -hmm. it's all about uh, connecting uh, dots from one, one dot to another. Mm -hmm. But there is also another episode in that, uh, that novel, in, in very initial f in pages, that uh, when, uh, mm, when Sherlock Holmes said that uh, uh, Watson uh, said that how to reach that the truth, and he said that uh, that el eliminate all other factors, and and the one which remains must be the truth. So, 
I'm just saying that I'm just uh, curious about that. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the alienation, yeah. Uh, uh, it's not about just the uh, deduction Would you also. Mind pull it? Do you have the page in front yeah, of you? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a page helpful. number five, it's just initial page, just first paragraph. Oh, okay. Uh, when they are talking about the telegraph. So, alienation as a tool to search for the truth. So, page number five. Just one second. At the beginning. Yeah, this is the one about the uh, telegram. They are tel talking right. about the telegram. Yeah, yeah. So how then did you deduce the telegram? And they are talking about mm, uh, mm, mm. that... Uh, right, yeah. eliminate all other uh, factors. So I'm just looking at uh, alienation the, as a tool to search for the, uh, yeah, for yeah. the truth or to find that, that mm. clear fact. Mm. And, there is a, uh, and there is another episode which I'm looking for that... Uh, yeah, that uh, Ho Sherlock Holmes, uh, I find that very modern man, uh, a modern, um, Sherlock Holmes as a very modern man, not just mm -hmm. a scientific man, mm -hmm. very modern man with a very modern perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Do Doyle was um, that writing the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by the modern, just not as individual, as, uh, mm -hmm. who is not very heavy loaded with individuality. I'm talking modern man as a, who is very clear about the distance between the self and the other. Mm. When he says in the ch end of the um, uh, second chapter that uh, a client is to me a mere... The, can you give the page number? It's the page number, uh, chapter number second. The second last or when uh, that second last chapter when he said that uh, a client is to me a mere unit, a factor is in problem. Uh, emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear reasoning. So that Sherlock Holmes is very clear that I have to cl make a boundary mm -hmm. of that emotional and that professional. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Actually, that's a, you've introduced a word professional, which um, I find very useful in talking about uh, Sherlock Holmes, because there is, a, there is this, you know, what you are describing as a, a representation of the modern man in uh, Sherlock Holmes comes about also through this uh, professionalization um, of um, you know of you know of of, um, of kind of disciplined work behavior you know that uh, Holmes prides himself on on the kind of um, you know the kind of sharp laser focus on the work um, at hand and um, you know that when he's working it's as if you know, all the energies of selfhood are, um, are truly um, employed. He needs a puzzle in order to be alive. But when there is no puzzle, when there's nothing to solve, exactly. he's like a dead man. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when he needs to take, you know, co cocaine. Yeah. You know? The, is, the ending of the novel is very uh, interesting that way. There is a statement by Holmes that when he said, like, my mind needs problems. Mm. I need mm. problem and yeah, problem. Yeah. All that I need is a problem. Right, right. Because so how his mind is, is working, mm. <laughs> how, mm. how his mindset is, mm. how, his, how his mentally developed himself. Yeah. So all I need is a problem, constant problem. Mm -mm. Yeah, he's, he's very representative of a new um, uh, kind of professional. And Watson as the foil is a reminder of a kind of an older way, uh, you know, um, way of being in the world. You know, and he is kind of old school in so many respects. He still entertains romantic fantasies. He still has a kind of old fashioned, um, uh, almost, yeah, I mean, he's, he's inherited a lot of racial baggage, you know. He's the one who says, oh, uh, savage. You know, when he, dis when um, a home, uh, Holmes is giving a characteristics of Tonga, and he says, oh, uh, savage. So he has, he, you know, his whole mind is shaped by stereotypes of Orientalist imagery, and even that long um, Pondicherry Lodge description, presumably that's coming through the voice of Watson. You know, it's w w Watson's angle of vision is what enables that uh, Orientalist imagery um, to be uh, uh, written in the way that, uh, that it is. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that um, th this point about um, uh, Watson as needing activity of the puzzle, you know, that his mind needs to be engaged. And when there is no puzzle, there's no mystery to solve, 
uh, he's like a dead man, you know, and there's something very frightening in, um, in the, there's also one passage, and I know it may take a little bit of time, and I'm not going to waste, some of you may be familiar um, with it, but maybe I should, because it is, uh, uh, um, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you can just let me, Yeah, this is in chapter, um, chapter chapter six. Sherlock Holmes gives a demonstration, and I'll very quickly uh, go to this um, chapter because um, I think it's it tells us a lot about about Holmes um, that even frightens Watson. And let me give you give you the page number. Yeah, it's on page 19, second column, second column. And uh, right in around the middle of the page, the paragraph that begins, it will be clear enough to you soon. Do you have that? If you go down a few sentences, this is Watson describing Holmes. He says, so swift, silent, and furtive were his movements, like those of a trained bloodhound picking out a scent, that I could not but think what a terrible criminal he would have made had he turned his energy and sagacity against the law instead of exerting them in its defense. So this is a, this frightens uh, Watson, you know, that he looks at Watson, uh, at, uh, at Sherlock Holmes as a person who partakes of uh, the qualities of a criminal, you know, in the way that his physic, you know, physical uh, traits um, are described. That, um, um, that if he had not turned his energy no, he says, what a terrible criminal he would have made had he turned his energy and sagacity against the law instead of exerting them in its defense. That this is a, I mean, you talked about him as a modern man, but the, um, the line between good and evil is a very thin one. Um, again, something we'll be talking about with Jekyll and Hyde, that uh, Sherlock Holmes um, is, you know, he seems not to be interested in worldly ambition. He seems not to be interested in taking any credit for solving the crime. But there's something in the fact of his um, uh, exerting his intellectual capacity for the pleasure of it, rather than for any other purpose, that frightens Watson. Because Watson wants himself, and I think he wants Holmes, to be driven by some larger objective, at the ethical goal that one does it for the restoration of peace and justice in the world. Hmm? Moral purpose, exactly. You know, that Watson still, that's why I, I, I mentioned that um, Watson seems very old school. You know, that he believes in romance. He believes in moral purpose. He believes in, you know, civilization and bringing the benefits of civilizations to others. Sherlock Holmes seems to be very much out of the loop in that way. Uh, he is the one, after all, who extracts Jonathan Small's story. He keeps silent, and he says, you tell your story. You know, he allows the criminal to speak. Jones doesn't want a uh, criminal. Uh, Jones doesn't want Small to speak. But it's Sherlock Holmes who elicits the narrative. So there's this very uncertain line about Sher uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes's own character that he, um, it, he could have easily used his intelligence to do evil uh, rather than good. Um, it's like, I don't know, how many of you have ever seen that um, show called Breaking Bad? You know, it's about, yeah, because it's, it's sort of like that. You know, that here's this chemistry uh, teacher who um, should be, you know, using his knowledge about science and chemistry for 
for great things. And instead, he uses that um, uh, knowledge to turn out the best um, um, uh, product, you know, um, um, uh, i.e. drugs. Um, so it's like that, you know, the, that character in Breaking Bad is like the Sherlock Holmes figure, you know, someone who is always on the cusp of either doing good for society or someone who ends up doing bad, uh, evil, um, and working against um, society and against the law. So it's, it's curious that this novel is really sort of located on the fault lines between um, you know, uh, colonial control, um, which we, you know, which we see as, you know, we, at one level you can think about the imperial sovereign, but the imperial sovereign also has elements of, um, of destructiveness, you know, destroying the very edifice of progress and of good for others, and instead doing things only for oneself or for, you know, for more nefarious purposes. Watson senses that in Holmes. So uh, it was a line that I really wanted to um, ask you to uh, pay attention to. Um, do we have, I know definitely we don't have time. It's two hours just for this session. But if anyone has a quick comment or question. Uh, I just wanted to make an observation. The story lends itself to counter-colonial uh, no, discourses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, subversive. Anti, you mean anti-colonial? Yeah, it has a very subversive potential. Don't forget Doyle is Irish. Okay. No? So it has a very subversive potential oh, yeah. as far yeah. as colonial discourse, uh, yeah, yeah. discourses yeah. are concerned. Yeah. That is what struck me. Yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, 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 that's why I would reiterate, you know, Doyle was an Irishman who, um, as you know, um, we talked about that with Kim, the uh, Kim lecture, that the, um, um, you know, there were actually more alliances between the Irish and the, and the Indians against the British than there were alliances between the Irish and the British. The anomaly, of course, was that there were Irish um, soldiers who were inducted by the British into the British Army who were sent out to India. So that's a more complicated situation which we, you know, just should recognize. But it is a fact. It's true. I agree with you. I think this is a very, this is a subversive novel. And Jonathan Small's story is one of the most subversive in the uh, Doyle canon. And it is the... Um, you know, Asian race, which is usually portrayed as being, uh, you know, very dishonest and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it is the English officers here mm -hmm. who fit into that role. Yeah, yeah. You know? they're, the e they're the bad guys. Mm. And know? this opium, you know, as far as uh, Sherlock Holmes is concerned, mm -hmm. it is for mental exaltation. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the rebels, it is the opium and bung eating devils. Yeah, so yeah that's all, a good point. So all through there is a good point. quite a lot of uh, subversive potential mm -hmm. I sensed in this. If we wanted to yeah, yeah, just yeah. take that as a trajectory from... Yeah, no, that's this. a great point about the opium. You know, that the opium is associated with um, kind of um, s sensual um, excess and um, sort of surrender of will in the, in, among the Indians, but when an Englishman like Holmes can, um, consumes opium, it's, uh, or cocaine in this case, it's to, for mental exaltation. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that, that, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good point. So should we stop here? It's 12 o'clock. It's really well beyond um, time. Unless anyone has a quick comment. Yeah, Alvin? Well, uh, I feel that after the narrative of Jonathan Small, uh, he has been portrayed as a person more sinned against than sinned. Who? Uh, Jonathan Small. Yes, yes. Uh, because uh, yes. Uh, after the pressure passes into the hands of the British, there is no mention of these uh, mm -hmm. uh, other three persons mm -hmm. who was involved in uh, the pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like there is an erasure of the crimes committed by Jonathan Small mm -hmm. in acquiring the pressure. Uh, I think there is, there is no justice there. There's no justice there, but he does keep repeating that um, his uh, band of brothers has been unjustly served and that he is going to go back to England to, um, to retrieve the, the, the treasure. The other problem is that the three are not able to leave uh, Andaman Islands. You know, they're, they're consigned to the, uh, to the Andaman Islands, 
whereas he manages to, you know, to escape with, uh, with Tonga, but with the single-minded pursuit of revenge. And um, so Jonathan Small's shifting allegiance, you know, that, that he moves away from any loyalty to the British, to, and I think this is what Kalpana was referring to as the subversive element, you know, that the rebels are not just the rebels in Kanpur, in the mutiny. The rebels are actually these poor white Englishmen who um, are uh, cheated by their superiors, because that's what Marston and Sholto do. They, when they hear about this treasure, they dupe the, um, you know, they dupe Jonathan Small into revealing its location. And they take the treasure and they uh, leave these people in jail. So it's, um, you know, it's, um, you know, in that way, the, this, this story is about the making of rebels, you know, who are from within the English, uh, uh, English class.